I think we're live. I've said before that I will start every single office hours with, are we live? Because I'm not sure, and today continues. You can see uh, I'm not alone here. We've got a, got another human here. This is Ryan Culp. Hey, everyone. Nice to meet you. Ryan is the, the founder of FOMO, usefomo.com, which is, the I think, the first social proof see, uh, Social proof uh, plugin, would you call it? Platform. Platform. Social proof platform for websites. So it, uh, it's a snippet that you install on your site, and it has the appearance of a busy storefront. So like, Dave subscribed. Dave bought, you know, a new pair of jeans. So uh, that's that's at least what I think FOMO is. Do you want to? Yes. Describe FOMO in a more clear way. I like when other people introduce the product <laughs> because it's our fault if he didn't do a good job. Um, that's exactly right. So what are you proud of your customers? Uh, you want to show off what they're doing. They're buying, they're shining up, they're leaving reviews. Um, but asking your customers to, to work for you, to sell for you, to refer friends, whatever, um, it's kind of sticky. You know, they're paying you and you're asking them to become a free salesperson. So with FOMO, uh, what we try to do is remove that work element from your customers, helping you get more customers. Um, we have a lot of integrations, an API, Zapier, anything you can think of, you can probably connect to FOMO. Um, and, uh, and that increases your conversions, builds trust, and uh, kind of creates an interesting browsing experience for your visitors. Great, thanks for, uh, thanks for explaining that. Yeah. So Ron and I were working together um, I'm really happy to have him on here because we were working together a few years ago when I first discovered Zapier, Blockspring, all these automation tools and started coding as for losers. So our, our kind of work together on marketing with startups was kind of the inspiration for, for a lot of the stuff that, that I'm doing now. Um, Actually, funny story, I remember the moment that David conceived coding as for losers. We were working on this other company, and it was the summer of 2015. I think it might have been July 28th, but I, I can't be for certain. <laughs> and we were on a flight from New York City to San Francisco, and we were sitting next to each other. And he's listening to his music, which is a little different than, than my music. And uh, he takes his headphones off and says, I was just listening to Janis Joplin. Boys is losers. Women is for losers. Women is for losers. And I figured it out. Coding is for losers. And he started. Because well, you were coding. You yeah. were learning to code on the planet. I was I'm learning. Like, that looks horrible. <laughs> it's cryptic. Yeah. And and then, like, I thought it was like a that day meditation, you know? And then David started coding is for losers a short time later. So, yeah, I was there. Yeah, you at were. Day zero. You were a key part of the inspiration for cutting for losers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, yeah, today, like, feel free to holler with um, with Q and A as as we talk through this. Um, but basically, we're, what we're going to be talking about today is how Ryan has implemented a lot of these kind of automation strategies um, in his business at FOMO. How he thinks about automation, what his process is for getting from like a concept for automating something um, to an end product and kind of what it's done for his business. Um, but do you want to start off with kind of like how you structure things at FOMO in terms of the team you have and, and how that has progressed and how you've thought about for sure. like so, thing as you've gone along? So I've always subscribed to the, um, or I've never subscribed to the idea that your product should do all of your marketing for you and that if you have a great product, everything will just work out. Um, it's fun to point to platforms like Facebook, et cetera, and say, well, you know, they grew like wildfire because there was some value inside of the product and people shared it. But a lot of us, particularly those of us with B2B products, um, don't get the same type of viral share component that you get from something like Facebook. Because frankly, a B2B product exists and it works and it makes money when it gives other companies a competitive edge. And so if I subscribe to something that helps me uh, beat my competitors some way, why would I share it? There's no incentive to share. So it, the, the, the best analogy is if I discovered a private island that had a million dollar a day scratch off lottery, I'm not going to tell my friends about it. If I keep winning it, I'm just going to keep ringing the register. And so there's this paradigm, I think, when you have a B2B platform where people don't really have an incentive to share you because you are why um, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the fact that other people don't know you exist is maybe part of why they get value from you. Once everybody does it, that's when the channel's blown, right? Um, and so we're always reinventing marketing channels. And so when we started building FOMO, um, we wanted to toggle those, those belief systems of can we bake marketing into the product or do we need to do stuff on the top line away from the product and try to like drive the, the herd of the traffic. So uh, the very first thing we did is we brought on a freelancer because the, the platform is not something I was very good at, at building on and we had him add this powered by link. Right, the, the coveted powered by backlink to your site because we have this widget and it shows notifications and we're showing a lot of these, 500 million of these every month. So we thought, well, 1% of 1% of 1% of people will click this and it will drive a ton of traffic and we'll get sales. And half of that was true. Uh, people clicked it, but the thing we didn't uh, perceive happening was the customers getting really, really upset with us. So we had to kill that. So that was like our first product marketing scheme and it didn't work out. And so. We started building out the developer team to focus on robust features, and then we started building out a marketing team to focus on getting people to, to check out those features. And uh, only recently have the, you know, previously, you know, never the twain shall meet, right? Um, so last year, we grew to five or six developers, a designer, a part-time project manager, and uh, four marketers. And the way we structured the marketing team First off, a lot of companies will have one marketer for every 10 developers or one marketer for every three salespeople or whatever. Yeah, I love how you flip that ratio. Yeah, we thought, hey, you know, marketing is just as important as the product because without marketing, nobody knows the product exists. So let's have equal marketer developer ratio. And I also thought that marketing should drive product and not the other way around. Um, and a lot of companies, the marketers are sort of told by the developers, here's what we can or will build, and here's when we'll get it done by, and here's the things that we're going to not prioritize. And the marketer is kind of um, emasculated in a way. And so I wanted it to be flipped. So as we brought on four marketers, and we already had four or five developers, we changed even our meeting schedules. So we were doing a developer stand-up on you know, Mondays or Wednesdays, and our marketing thing was going to be Tuesday or Thursday or something. Basically, we flipped it so that the marketing meeting happened every week before the developer meeting um, to emphasize in a literal chronological sense that marketing is going to drive product, not the other way around. And so the marketers would say, here's our products this week, here's our specs. The developers a day or two later would, would become privy to that and start hacking on it. Um, and so the way we set up the marketing team, um, and this was a lot of trial and error, but effectively, uh, developers, I find that when you hire them, and you have more work to do than they can get done, which is always the case, they're very welcoming to other developers. They might wanna interview them, they might wanna stress test them on some coding challenges, but generally they're very open to it. Whereas with marketers, when you wanna bring on more marketers, they're very uh, defensive and territorial. Mm -hmm. And so to have multiple marketers working in harmony, you kinda need to have them working on specific things that don't have too much overlap. Because oh yeah, totally set the lens. Set the lens, because or else what's gonna happen is, uh, the buttheads, and that's not good for morale, culture, or retention. Or they'll both kind of say, well, I can do it, you can do it, and then neither of them actually does it. So our first situation with that was ads, right? We hadn't done any ads. We'd been growing organically, but we thought, let's experiment with Facebook and AdWords and all of this stuff. And I said, guys, let's do some ads. And they said, yeah, let's do some ads. And then nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> and all of them had done ads before. You know, all of them who had been a sole marketer at a company previously were, uh, you know, probably had their own ideas about running a campaign or two. But when three people in the room could all kind of do it, no one really wanted to step up and take it. And so we started to give people, like David said, their own lanes. And we had a guy focused on cold email, finding leads, building sequences, that kind of thing. Those kinds of metrics, uh, replies, setting up appointments and meetings kept, meetings meetings booked. We had someone else thinking about content and working with the content editor who we hired to plot out an editorial calendar, guest post opportunities, backlinks, checking in on SEM rush, Google Search Console, making sure that our, our site was healthy. And then we had someone else doing a little more technical marketing, scraping, crawling, a um, little bit of coding, engineering as marketing, and then myself kind of doing whatever in between, partnerships, integrations. Um, and that worked okay, but we want to be uh, a profitable company and not necessarily the, the burn, churn and burn startup like a lot of our, our peers in the Valley, which you can see we're sort of in a Valley.
We're in a valley. <laughs> yeah. It's not the not capital T. It's not the same valley. valley. Uh, and so over the last few months, and this is what I was kind of leading up to, over the last few months, we um, reduced the team from around 10 or 11 to three. And um, we were able to replace those six, seven people with a lot of automations and tools. And so that's what we can maybe talk about a little bit. Yeah, I think the I'd love to start in automations with, you didn't mention really customer success, you know, that as like a specific role that you carve out for someone. But from what we've talked about, it sounds like most of your automation is aimed at quote unquote customer success, making people who've already signed up feel good yep. about using FOMO. So how do you how do you think about that as like a role and kind of what are the some of the core things that you've you started automating around that? Definitely. So any given sale in general, it's like you reach out, you close a sale, and then you sort of flip inside out where now you serve the customer. So you were trying to get them to come to you and then now you try to take care of them. And as we've grown FOMO, we now have, I think as of this morning, 3,950 paying monthly subscribers. And then we have another 1,000 free users or so. And so that's become a huge task, right, just to serve existing customers. We can't even, right, without the proper way structure, we can't even think about getting the 30. 951st customer because we have so many you know if one percent has a customer support request every hour right that's um that's a lot of stuff to think about and so over the last couple of months the way we've really found uh growth uh levers to be effective is just getting better at loving and serving our existing customers and there's several ways we have been able to do that um we basically took the book 22 immutable laws of marketing and it's really great, 100 pages, read it on a flight. Uh, every chapter is kind of a law of marketing. And it, it was written, I don't know, 20 years ago, early 90s maybe. Yeah. But it's quite good. And so basically we chose five laws. And a law could be the law of exclusivity, the law of being first to market, the law of product extension. And they're all sort of intuitive laws. you know. So you want people to think of you when they think of soda, if you're Coca-Cola. Uh, you want people to think of you when they're thinking of computers like Apple. Uh, and we chose five laws, and we thought, how can we build a customer success program around these laws? And we effectively spun up a Trello board, and uh, we looked at our churn rate, which was, I think, 10.9%. This was two, two and a half months ago. And we thought, well, let's get to 7% churn rate. So we named this Trello board Operation 7, and we made five lists. And each list was based on an immutable law of marketing. And then we abstracted that further to saying, okay, what are some tactical things we want to, or strategic things we want to achieve at the end of this mission, Operation 7, when it's over? One of them was making our customers feel like superheroes. One of them was educating customers about the power of social proof in general. FOMO is just one uh, manifestation of that. One of them was um, helping people understand conversion rate optimization better. So there's a mixture of education, feel good, uh, uh, and of course, actually proving ROI and from our platform. The interesting thing about that is like, your end goal is so anchored, grounded, and tangible. 7% churn. Yep. But like the ways you get there have nothing to do with anything necessarily like super measurable or tangible. Exactly, it's sort of definitely still this, this hodgepodge of specific goal, 7%, can't make it up, it's very measurable with Here's a bunch of things that we think will kind of create a death of a thousand stabs to that high churn. The opposite of that, the positive connotation. The positive connotation. Death death. The life of a thousand injections of, I don't know. Some, something, something good. Something good. B12. Sugar, depending on your, your genes. And uh, yeah, B12. And so we started kind of approaching each of these as then individual tasks broken further. So for example, um, making our customers feel like superheroes. If you're a marketer and our customers are marketers. Sometimes they're also developers or founders, but our ideal target audience, part of that is being a marketer. How do you, you know, you wake up every day, you're a marketer. What's something that you love as a marketer uh, on the internet if you're building a product? You probably love backlinks. You know, you, you feel a pat on your back when you get a backlink, when you get a press mention, when you get to do a guest post. So we thought, well, let's just help our customers do the things they already want to do. They want to get backlinks. So we started sending these emails. Um, earn a valuable backlink to your website. And these emails are automated. We're just using Mixpanel. We have a couple emails that come from our platform. But they basically say, if someone's been paying us for 
115 days, <laughs> four and a half months or so, on the 116th day, email them and it's subject line, earn a valuable backlink to your website. So as a marketer, click, and it says, hey, you know, uh, thanks for being with us, and we'll feature your, uh, your company on our website if you leave us a review. And so they can then go leave us a review. Uh, we have different places people do that. And within a few minutes, their review and their company website, therefore backlink, is featured on our website as promised. And that's increased our review cadence. And that's also empowered our customers, the marketer, to say, hey, I just got us a backlink from that tool we use, FOMO. And we're doing around 25 things like that, you know, um, are within this Operation 7 kind of program. And we're maybe halfway done, but I think our churn is at 6.9% right now, uh, as of a few days ago. Um, so I think it's working, but yeah, we had to just take a philosophy and a measurable goal and do some stuff in the middle, which is maybe black box, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely being exposed to the user and see if it makes an impact. So like, let's take that backlink review example. Um, obviously, that's something that's like super not core to the FOMO product, right? Mm -hmm. So you probably don't want to spend a lot of engineering time on that initially before you've proven that it, it connects to churn at all. Right. So like, how did you how did you hack that process together so that it didn't ruin your life, basically? Definitely. Um, so first, we needed a way to actually give people backlinks. Um, uh, we didn't have a customer review page on our website. We didn't have a place to do this. So the first thing we did was we made a Google form and we sent emails to 10 paying customers that we thought might uh, want to participate. And we said, hey, we'll write a case study. And they filled out the Google form. And in the Google form, we asked how much money they make per year, how they measure the use of FOMO, how long they've been using us. We really wanted to make sure that they could show ROI because that helps us. And uh, we wrote a couple case study blog posts. We already had a blog. There was no tech here. We made a Google form. Because that worked, the next level of abstraction was the auto email after four and a half months and a customer's page. But the customer's page was just copy and pasted HTML with like a box with their review and their name. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty cumbersome because we have this entire way to deploy our app and it takes several minutes and lots of copying and pasting code and wasn't really very clean. But we did it. So we did that for another few days. Uh, MVP'd this review page of just boxes that you saw. So you would just push, you would go in manually code the page and just push and update yeah. the app. I would copy and paste like this much HTML and just swap out their review yeah. and their link. And it wasn't pretty. Uh, but we did this in you know an hour. We got the page up and then I, I copied and pasted reviews that we had on other places into these HTML tags. And we thought this isn't going to scale. <laughs> but people liked it. And we looked in Google Analytics and we were getting a lot of traffic after hitting our home page. People were looking at our, at our testimonials page. We didn't have enough space in our navigation items to fit it with our previous ones. So I just took the navigation link that got the least traffic, moved it to our footer, mm -hmm. and then put the testimonials page in its place. So that was like a few day process. We did this case study thing, wrote a couple, did this review page, hard coded. That seemed to get traffic. Then we went to the next step and we abstracted it, I'd say version three, and um, we used Blockspring, uh, which you guys are probably all familiar with. And we were able to put all of our reviews in a Google Sheet, and now that same customer page just pulls from the Google Sheet and iterates through them on the page. Um, so that's where we're at now. Um, and the next step is going to be fetching those reviews as they happen and sticking them into our spreadsheet, which then just deploys them onto our website. But that will be maybe in another few weeks. Yeah, I think that's a really good use case for, for Blockspring um, that I haven't seen a lot of people doing. Um, I think most people think of Blockspring is kind of like a spreadsheet reporting tool. But or back for, office. Yeah, or like back office. But for me, like that's really not what it's for. It's right. for like chaining things together in a, in a process. Yeah, and one exercise could be just think of all the ways you might be using any spreadsheet or Blockspring, and it's probably, you know, for administrative operations, your eyes only, your team members' eyes only purposes. But think about how can I flip this into a production style uh, utility. Um, and that's what we're able to do. You know, our Blockspring spreadsheet setup is now literally a database that drives sales, <laughs> uh, more sales and clicks and conversions on our site because people who would otherwise bounce 
will say, well, let me see what their customers say about them. And it's just this endless scroll of I think almost 170 reviews mm -hmm. on that page. You can't even get to the bottom. You're probably going to just sign up by then. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, uh, I think you were mentioning something else kind of similar with uh, the Clearbit API with activation. Sure. And like taking something that's generally private and going public with like new customers. Could you share a little bit about that? For sure. So earlier days of FOMO, someone would sign up, we'd all freak out, ring a gong, um, and we could, you know, we could be really personalized in how we reached out to them. And um, that was great. But as you grow, you start getting five signups a day, 10, 20, 30, 50, right? And so at, that, at this point, I think we're at around 550 signups a month which 550 paying customers, new paying customers a month, more than that in signups. But even that number with only three of us um, and no dedicated salesperson uh, is, is kind of a lot to handle. So we tapped into Clearbit, which is basically, you know, enrichment, you feed in an email and it tells you everything it can about that person, gender, age, income, where they live, who they work for, all that stuff. And we started doing some interesting things to help with onboarding and also to help with this um, customer success. Because one of those other five pillars I didn't mention was relationship building. We want customers to feel they actually have a relationship with us and our brand. And um, so what we're doing with Clearbit now is when someone signs up, we immediately enrich them based on their email and we follow them on Twitter if they have, I think, at least 50 or 100 followers. We don't follow everybody because some people aren't really tweeters like me. And um, after we follow them, we then put them into this shout out queue. And every week on Thursdays, I think, we do Twitter shout outs to people who recently signed up. And we stack rank that on our back end by the number of followers they have. So Pat Flynn went live with us last week and our Twitter bot auto followed him. He tweeted about us that day and he mentioned us. So I think he was kind of noticed maybe on his phone. Because you were there. Because we were there. And then that Thursday, we said, hey, great to be working with at Pat Flynn this week. But all of that was automated. I didn't log into the Twitter to do it. Uh, and that's grown our following, and that's given people more cognizance of where we are across channel. Because ideally, people are signing up for FOMO, implementing it, and then they never have to log in again. But by following them on other channels, it keeps us more top of mind from that marketer's tool belt perspective. So that's one thing we do with Clearbit. Another thing we do with Clearbit that we just started, also in this Operation 7, uh, which was the time to live, you know, how can we reduce the time from email password enter button to notification showing on your site right now? Let's say the average time to live so like is an in install oh, an install. Not. Yeah. Like right. Let's say right now it's three days. How can we make it three minutes? And um, there's some things that aren't in our control, right? Planting a snippet of code. That's up to, that's up to the user, but recommending things and um, helping a customer understand and educate how the product works is something we control. So another way we use Clearbit is when a user adds their website to, to FOMO, we instantly crawl their website to see what technologies they use. Do they use Optimizely? Do they use Google Analytics? Um, do they use Contact Form 7 by WordPress? You know, any of these tools that they use, we get from tools like Built With and Clearbit. We then send them an email that says, hey, you know, we checked out your website, and here are a few things that you appear to be using that we already integrate with directly. And then we merge in a bulleted list of, of tools that we integrate with, specifically that we found that they are using on their site. And then we go further than that. We say, and here's some resources you might find interesting. So let's say someone is using Optimizely on their site. Well, we wrote a, site, uh, we wrote a guest post for how to um, A-B test FOMO using Optimizely. So we'll link that as a resource. So we're linking blog posts, direct links to integrations, and that's on a per website basis. It's super, super targeted. And people respond and say, wow, thanks. You know, we, we, we kind of did the, the think work for them, and that increased the activation rate. So there's two things with Clearbit. The first thing is just enriching a new sign-up. Mm -hmm. Based on their email. Based on their email. You take their email, and you get all the other information that's publicly available through Clearbit about them, where they work, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. So that's step one. Step two is actually taking action on another channel, so whether it's sending an email. So I'm assuming that the email piece is like Mixpanel, right, or some kind of triggered email? Or it's a triggered email out? from our end. It was a little tough to basically tell Mixpanel, here's a bunch of dynamic content to merge in. Yeah. But effectively, it's like that. It's, it's but you triggered. Code, but you coded it up. We coded it up. Okay, cool. 
Um, what about the clear bit piece? Did you, I know you can use clear bit with block spring in Google Sheets. Did you mm -hmm. hack together like an MVP with that? Or did you go straight to code? We hacked together an MVP with a clear bit competitor. Mm -hmm. um, who gave us free service for a couple months. And Full contact? No, brand new. You haven't heard of that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so the effort to get it going to see, hey, is enrichment valuable? Will people be wowed if we know th things about them that they don't think we know about them? We did that will they be with. Creeped out? Yeah, will <laughs> they be creeped out? Yeah, exactly. We MVP'd that with, with another tool. And um, we also uh, set up pings that basically said this person has this many followers on Twitter, for example. So that was a quick way in our Slack room, right, with nothing else set up. Our very first implementation of this was simply they sign up and our Slack channel would say, here's their LinkedIn and here's like their Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. And I think I even made it say, here's their follower to following ratio. Because if someone has 80,000 followers and you click and they follow 80,000 people, they're, they're kind of like a shyster. So we showed their ratio, their LinkedIn, and that led us throughout the day while we were doing other regular stuff, kind of see, oh, someone who has 19,000 followers and only follows 80 people just signed up. Maybe I should send them a quick email, right? So we could copy their email to my clipboard from Slack and just say, hey, just want to let you know, you know, we're glad to have you trying this out. Is there anything I can help with? And that was how we MVP'd this like account management. And then over time, we bolted on Enrichment, Clearbit. And the most recent thing we did was the, um, the application or the website crawling. Yeah, so so that's all stuff that you coded up after kind of like hacking it together manually. Exactly, and we wouldn't have invested in any of the coding stuff if we didn't get something positive out of the, the manual. Because there's way too much to be working on otherwise to go straight to a proper feature. Yeah, so let's talk about that kind of like progression. Um, you know, because we talk a lot, and, and all of the stuff on Coding is for Losers, right, is like spreadsheet automation. Mm -hmm. But I really think spreadsheets are, you know, in the continuum from completely manual to coding, spreadsheets are in the middle. Yep. Um, so how, how do you, do you plan for that progression when you made your Trello board and had like all these tactics you're going to try? for project seven or whatever it's called. Yeah. Did you think about their progression or did you just think about the first step and, and see if it works before you make any of those decisions? Yeah, so I would say it was a combination of just what are our resources and constraints, like what are our realities combined with what is the goal? So if the goal is 7% churn and our theory is if we send people, you know, free t-shirts and onboarding tips and recommendations and all of this, that our churn will go down. Then we have to work backwards from there and say, well, but there's only three of us. Or, well, but we didn't raise any venture capital. Or, well, we don't have any special connections. So how do we do that? And um, the spreadsheet progression, I think we'd be very happy to keep as many things in spreadsheets as possible. I mean, our reviews, the, the funny thing about what we're saying now is the way that we now show reviews on our website, its final manifestation is spreadsheets, right? It yeah. started with code, and we streamlined it to a spreadsheet state. Well, manual, manual code up. Yeah, manual yeah. code, copy paste, blog posts, um, which were very, you know, tiring. I said it was an MVP, but that wasn't easy, you know, to get someone on the phone and do a case study and have them approve it and their content yeah, it was team. Like and, maximum viable product. Yeah, maximum. It's like so we went from a ton of work to then coding to now our our like realized version is a spreadsheet. And so I would I would be cautious to even assume that spreadsheets is the V1 and something else is later because spreadsheets could be the final outcome. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we look at all of the things we're doing and say, just what's the right tool for the job? And a lot of times spreadsheets, because you can have formulas because they interact with websites if you want them to, with things like BlockSpring, um, can be the final output. So for example, on the sales side, a lot of people think about spreadsheets when you think about leads and contacts, if you're using cold outreach tools. Um, one thing that we really hated doing if we got a new batch of leads was sanitizing them. So making the names, the proper casing, removing, you know, LLC from the company name. If you're going to merge like in. list cleaning, list cleaning. Stuff. And so we were always making spreadsheets that had kind of formulas that would just keep filtering and doing find and replace. And that was okay. But we thought, let's just stick this logic that we already built in the spreadsheet into something like a one click button. So we made a free tool called friendly CSV. You can go to the site and um, upload a list of leads, and it will just take care of all that for you. 
So we're able to manufacture these little tools, but we wouldn't have known how to go about that logic if we hadn't spent months dedicating uh, filtering and formulas and spreadsheets first. What was the link to that? So it's a it's a janky link. It's friendly dash csv friendly dash csv dot <laughs> dot Heroku app dot com. Oh, it's a Heroku. Yeah, maybe one day we'll maybe one day we'll log in and change the DNS. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, but it's a it's a cool little tool. Another thing that we did in terms of automation and it was a very high tech low tech was you know when you're sending cold emails whether it's for press fundraising customers. You get all these auto replies. You get bounces. You get out of office. You get I'm on vacation. You get John no longer works here, and that kind of is demoralizing to check your inbox. Uh, it's demoralizing to hit send. <laughs> yeah, because you're you're sorting through this. It's not why you exist. And so we realized that Gmail filters can do a pretty good job of detecting 503 error bounces, etc. So we basically open sourced our Gmail filters, uh, which I'm happy to share after in the in the notes. Um, and you just log into Gmail hit settings, filters, upload this file that will give you, and it will automatically take care of auto replies and bounces, and it will stuff them into a folder called sales, subfolder OOO, or subfolder auto reply, or subfolder bounced. And that should make it a little more um, uh, palatable when you're going to send a batch of emails to a group of strangers who might not <laughs> exist anymore. So, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so you, you guys may not know this, but Ryan is is kind of like the king of cold email and like sales process automation. Like that's that's like your thing, right? Like you had the sales hacking course and you're well known for for doing this type of stuff. But you just told me yesterday that you're quitting cold email. Yes. Um and that that's interesting to me because it's like yes, some things like in a lazy sense, yeah. some things aren't necessary. To yes. do to grow a business. In fact, most things you don't actually have to do that you think you might have to do. Yes. So I'm curious, like, why, why quitting cold email now, given it's like you know, it's kind of one of your core tools. Yes. So uh, cold email has gotten to the point where everyone's doing it, and once everyone does it from the from the seller perspective, um, the buyer, that other business or consumer they become savvier, right? So every time we come out with a new cold email tactic, you know, now you can merge in a logo, right? Your, your prospect's logo into an infographic embedded in your cold email, right? That's the latest thing is, is image merge tags. Um, in a few months, right, the consumer will go, oh yeah, they merged my logo in, you know, using the Clearbit API. And it's crazy to think that because even a couple of years ago, savvy tech people didn't know like they were amazed by the concept of a merge variable. Like, hey, first name. That was like, wow. And consumers, of course, were totally blindsided. And as as we've leveled up on the capacity to personalize emails, so have the consumers. You know, they're they're barely trailing behind. And so I think that cold email it could essentially become the next banner ad, right? Nineteen ninety five banner it's ads, like four percent click. Yeah, and now banner ads like point oh 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 four percent click. And you know, if you want to just uh, shove down people's throat with just enormous resources, you know, of course you can make it work. Um, the oldest cold email campaign in the history of cold email is the Nigerian print scam. And it, it obviously works more than 0% of the time because I still get the emails, uh, but it works less than it used to. Right. And so as you have your, again, limited resources, constraints, et cetera, you want to be kind of focusing on, in my opinion, the bleeding edge channels and tactics that aren't yet saturated because they have the highest conversion rates. And cold email, as it becomes easier to do and easier to send more messages a day using like a whitelisted IP address instead of your Gmail, which will throttle you, it also becomes easier to ignore, easy to filter out, and less convincible, less convincing. So I think um, you know, what I did something like cold email for a couple of years, got great results. I'm seeing those returns diminish. And I'm kind of looking for that next frontier. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the next frontier that you've, you know, stumbled into or just like found your way into through experimentation is these super just like out of the box customer success automation tactics that like people just simply won't do. It's just a large enough a large enough number of companies cannot do because they won't make the effort. Right. So things like uh, 
like you were telling me about doing user testing on your customers' websites and yes. things like that. Yes, so this is something we're really excited about. So, you know, the first time I signed up for a MailChimp paid account, not the free account, but when I paid maybe nine bucks a month a few years ago, they sent me a, uh, like a beanie of, the, of their mail, of their chimp. And uh, it was hand knit. It was really cool. I had to Google it, like MailChimp beanie, because it was so intricate. And sure enough, they had a local artisan in Atlanta making these beanies. And their philosophy was, hey, when you become a paying customer, we're just going to give you your first month's bill just right, right back to you um, to show you that we're sort of in bed together. And I thought that was really cool, and that stuck with me. And so now we're trying to figure out ways at FOMO. And, and yeah, you have to do a spreadsheet. You have to do some annoying stuff to make it not kill you. Um, but we're trying to figure out how do we give customers their money back <laughs> in a way that is, is in the long run strategic for our growth. Um, because another cold email campaign or another pay-per-click I don't think is really that interesting. It may be scalable. It may be sustainable. I don't know. But it's just not that interesting. And it's our company, so we should do whatever is interesting, right? So now we're doing this thing where we send people tips uh, about how to increase conversions on their website that have nothing to do with FOMO, nothing to do with any particular tool. And the way we're doing that is we're making these screen share videos where we just do like a teardown audit of their homepage. We say, hey, here's what I think this does, or this took four seconds to load, or this image is kind of big, or it doesn't look great on mobile, or I was confused by this sentence. Just a thinking out loud kind of barf of ideas and, and a, a five second check gut feedback. And we're creating these videos. They're totally free for our users. Of course, it costs us money, right? But we're MVPing it right now to see if it's helpful. And when I sent a message a couple days ago to 20 potential candidates, and I got five opt-ins immediately, one of them, who's actually one of our biggest customers, uh, they pay us 500 bucks a month, he said, we love this. And by the way, if it's helpful, we'd love to start paying for this. We need all the help we can get. So it, it really opened up by accident a new revenue stream for us, which I don't think we'll pursue because we're a software company. Um, but we're just figuring out how do we give customers their money back in a way that in the long term, you know, pays us back. And so we've been MVPing that with a couple emails, making a couple videos with QuickTime. But over the next few weeks, if the customers think that it's useful, we're going to turn this into, again, an automated solution. So day 97, you've paid us three times. Let's say you've paid us 150 bucks. We'll pay someone a dollar a minute, seven bucks, to make a video, to email it back to you, embed it in a landing page. You can tell if it's helpful or not. And if it is, maybe we send you a t-shirt or something. So that will happen later. But It almost reminds me of like the, uh, it's, it might be called the giving pledge, but it's probably not. It's like people pledge a certain percentage of their income oh, to sure. charity every year. Yeah. And like set it and forget it. It's kind of like that. But for business, like yes. you bake into the cake that you're going to give rather than just like giving a discount, which cash doesn't do that much for you, especially if you have budget to mm -hmm. spend. Um, what does something for you is like getting something a surprise that you didn't know that you needed necessarily, but helps you. Exactly. It's like, what if McDonald's said, look, you know, entry fee is five dollars and you get a happy meal for free. Um, you're you're always paying you're always paying for something as the consumer and you're always getting you know you're always covering your costs and passing it on to the consumer as a business but based on how you position it you can wow your customer or just make them roll their eyes and so you know we could say that we had to raise prices so that we could provide great services or we can just figure out margins on our end and and just make a concerted effort to give back a percentage of the income to the user and and hope that that will work in the long run um, i mean even you know, a couple of years ago, uh, I did a lot of Airbnb as a host, and they would rent my apartment in New York City. You know, you can rent your apartment for a lot of money in New York City to to tourists, and I would always get them, let's say, a twenty five dollar bottle of wine. Um, thanks to David, he had another company. Then I would give them nice soaps and lotions and shampoos, and all kinds of things. I'd give them snacks sometimes, and. Um, they would always appreciate it. They'd leave a note, whatever. But my friends, my business friends, my marketer friends would say, how can, you know, $20, $30, you're spending all this money on your Airbnb guests. And I said, look, they just gave me, you know, two grand to stay here for eight days. I'm giving them like 0.5% of their money back. Like it's, it's a joke. I have a 99% margin, but that, if that gets me that fifth star on an otherwise four star uh, review, the, the return is, is exponential. It's, it's, 
it's almost a crime not to invest cash, some amount of cash back into the customer who just gave it to you. Yeah, I think it all comes back to like relationships and yeah, it's a customer business relationship, but it is a give and take. Yeah. Any good relationship has a give and a take. It's not a one way valve. Ever. That's right. And you know, here's something you can do uh, to start building better relationships with your customers and it doesn't cost any money and it doesn't require knowing their shipping address or their t-shirt size. And this is also something that we've just implemented for Operation 7. So uh, at different day marks of their membership, we send them an automatic introduction email. So there's a site we both used a while ago called Growth Geeks. And Growth Geeks did this kind of interesting borderline thing where if you're a customer of Growth Geeks, you'll get this email that says, you know, intro, Ryan, John. And you open the email and it says, Ryan, you know, John's going to help you automate your social media. Click here to hire John. And it was kind of just a sales email with an interesting subject line. But that stuck with me. And so what we're now doing uh, at FOMO as well is on, I think, the 30-day mark, they get an email from me that says, uh, hey, I'm Ryan, founder of FOMO. Uh, I wanted to introduce you to Arnold, right? Here's his email. You can reach out to him directly if you ever have, you know, he's our product manager. If you ever have any feature ideas or whatever, if you have any support requests or something like that, reach out to him. People are now replying to that email. We just turned it on a couple weeks ago and people are hitting that 30 day threshold. They're saying, wow, thanks so much for introducing me. I'll keep this in mind. So they're not even pinging Arnold. They're not even bothering Arnold or creating support requests, but they're feeling this warmth that I'm giving them the explicit uh, permission to, to reach out to people directly. And then I think at the 60 or 89 day mark, Mixed Panel doesn't let you do queries past 90 days. Um, but at the 89 day mark, they get that identical email, except it's to Chris, our lead engineer. And it says, hey, wanted to connect you with Chris. He's our lead developer. If you have any feature requests, he's happy to hear them. Just reach out to him directly here. So we're not even CCing Arnold. I'm not even CCing Chris. Arnold and Chris don't even necessarily know this thing is turned on. They'll find out soon. <laughs> um, but the point is our customers are replying and saying, wow, thank you so much for like this, this connection. And that doesn't cost any money, but that helps build our relationships. And that's a really good example of like the um, like the arms race and like hedonistic treadmill of a lot of these channels and customer success ideas. So like the founder in the founder intro welcome email has become like the de facto one direct email that every startup turns on. Yep. It's like, hey, thanks for signing up. One well, personally, thank you. Yeah, like holler if you have questions. Um, that's great, but like now that every single company does it, it's completely tuned out, and that, that email just gets deleted. It's exactly. Like, and exactly. No one's in exactly. No one's introducing. And think about support, right? As you grow, grow a company, you try to make your support more strict. You know, oh, if you have questions, you know, email us. Email our support inbox. Fill out a ticket here. You get stricter and stricter about how people can get in touch with your coveted support team. But doing something like this, a direct intro to your support line, you know, even though we have a knowledge base, even though we have, you know, we're going to have videos and more resources to help people self-service, that direct intro just cuts through that. And, and I'm not going to say, like, we're innovating, but the point is other companies aren't doing that yet, right? So this is like cold email three years ago, the team intros now. And I think a lot of, well, any company that has more than one person on their support team is like hesitant to form any type of personal relationship between support team and their customers. Right. Um, but you can, you obviously can. Yep. You can do account wraps, assign like lanes for different support people. Yep. But, uh, but yeah, I guess it comes back to relation. So what were the five, maybe we can wrap it up yeah. pretty soon, but like we'd love to hear just like the five pillars that were on that Trello board. For sure. I'm going to open it up now. Um, let's see. And this was the other thing I was thinking of, you know, when you want to get stuff done, and like it has to get done, not you want to get done. Um, you know, when, I guess, what was it when they built the Apple II and they just got their own building? Yeah. Right? It's like, let's just give ourselves a separate botch, a batch of resources, right? If I had added Operation 7 ideas, you know, we're going to reduce our churn and love our customers. If I just threw those ideas and tasks and assignments in with the rest of our day-to-day, -day, fix this bug, whatever, I don't think it would have gotten accomplished with the same attitude or, or vigilance. But instead, I made a new Trello board, as lame and as simple as that is. 
I changed the background color of this Trello board, I'm looking at it now, to orange. All of our other Trello boards are like blue, right? And I made the list names a little bit different. So the five pillars were social proof education, conversion rate optimization resources, client relationship building, turn users into superheroes, and uh, increasing product and feature visibility. And we strung together five, six tasks per pillar, and we're just kind of banging them out. And uh, at any given time, we have a few tasks that we're, that we're actively doing, but we're pretty much just picking and choosing what feels good. And so looking at our churn now around 7%, I'll, I'll check that too. We're gonna turn around 7% and we're only halfway through operation seven. Um, I think it's working. Yeah, that's the, the funny thing about measurement. That was for you. Yeah, let's see if like this active month. Okay, we're now at 7.6. 7.6, 7.6, okay. 7.6 revenue, 7.1% on user churn. Okay, so you're, you're on the way. Yeah, we're getting there. But the interesting thing to me is like, so you have this whole Trello board of ideas and things that you executed, right? But you're not necessarily measuring each one of those. Right. Are you measuring any of them? Or is it just mm -hmm. like bucket, how do we feel about the response to this? And like, what's the end like anchored KPI? We're measuring kind of a hybrid. We're measuring some things very explicitly. So for example, one of the things is um, making our users right, feel good about product, product and future visibility. So we built a badge program. You've gotten badges from Foursquare and other sites, so that's not new. Badge for some of Milestone. And uh, we built this badge program, but because we had so many badges and designs and emails we wanted to send, there was no way we could really just do it with like mixed panel. So we ended up creating a table in our database. So we actually have records in a database of this badge was sent to this person for this metric on this day. And um, that's been really helpful for measurement because now we can see that we've sent, you know, let's say 1,400 badges, I checked last night, over the last three weeks since it's been live. And these badges are anything from, you just connected Google Analytics, congrats, now you're on your way to being a data-driven marketer. It makes people feel good about, about connecting Google Analytics. Or you just got your first click and it says you never forget your first click. And, uh, and all these have goofy images. Uh, one of our badges, when we turned this on, uh, I think it was when you got 10 clicks or something, and so naturally on day one, it sent to more people because we had a backlog of users who qualified for the badge but had never gotten it. And it said something like, I, I, you is just like Christopher mother effing Columbus minus the killing and raping. And, and it had like an anchor badge image. And immediately we got a live chat from someone who said, I just received an email this morning that said mother effing and killing and raping. And I don't appreciate that. And we said, oh, you know, sorry, you know, that was a guy on our team in Europe and he didn't understand, so we've changed it. And that was actually all true. It was our designer in Europe who wrote that and we changed it. Um, so we've gotten this reception where some people will reply to these badges and say, love these badges or haha, this one made me laugh or whatever. And that's definitely being measured. Click rate, open rate, how many we've sent. I think every day, let's say we might send 30 or 40 a day. And I think that that's helping. Um, but yeah, we're still having to go a little bit with gut and think that well, we were sending badges, churns going down, they're interrelated. Yeah, there's no way to really tease that out. Yeah, and that's, that's what separates, that's what makes being an entrepreneur kind of fun is you don't have to, as much data as there is, and as, as many ways as there are to analyze data, there's some things that, you know, attribution is still going to always be really tough in marketing. And when you go with your gut or something feels good and then you get even qualitative anecdotal feedback, like a reply that says, I love this badge, um, you can feel good about it and keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of fuel to, to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, cool, Ryan. Well, thanks so much for being here and hanging out for yeah. a bit, talking about this stuff. Um, where can people find you and where can people find FOMO? Anyway. Sure. So you can check out FOMO at usefomo.com. And uh, we have a free trial. If you want more free trial days, let me know. I'm Ryan at usefomo.com. And you could also find me on Twitter at Ryan C K U L P. I mostly talk about politics. So <laughs> you, you might not want to get involved, but that's where I'm at. Cool. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thanks, guys. Take care, guys. See ya.